Um, like you said, we've muted everyone. I'm hoping that we will be able to have an exchange. If you have any questions during the presentation, or if you have comments, I'm hoping we can learn from each other. Please put them in the chat box. Robert is going to be monitoring the chat box and let me know if there are people who have either questions or comments. So please do that as we're presenting. I just want to say welcome. My name's Linda Stein. I've been gardening for about 40 years and about six years ago, I became a Dakota County Master Gardener, which is a program within the University of Minnesota's Extension Program. I did that because I wanted to kind of learn what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong and have the opportunity to do programs like this. As master gardeners, we promote programs such as clean water, horticulture practices, promotion of pollinators and other horticulture related topics. And this is one of them. Um, to start, you know, this has been a crazy year, and I think every presentation and every place that we have, every meeting you've gone to probably starts out with that comment, and it surely has been, but gardening has been such a wonderful respite for many of us. But so now as the summer is drawing to a close and fall is coming, we start to think, well, what's going to happen next? So, uh-oh, it is not advancing. I'm, it's not progressing, Robert. So do what you did before. I um, did. I'm going to go out. There's still people joining, so. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, this was working a minute ago. There, now it's working. So I'm looking, I think we all have kind of mixed feelings when we get to this time of the season. Some, for some of us, it's the sadness, of course, that we're no longer able to enjoy our gardens. For those, especially those of us who've had um, uh, vegetable gardens, you have the excitement as you bring all those wonderful vegetables into your kitchen. Oops, now it's... For others, it's the relief that you no longer have to go out and weed every spare moment or deal with those Japanese beetles or other pests that are attacking your plants. And finally, for some of us, it's the frustration that you've had these wonderful plants and that some of them have ended up in the compost pile because they had diseases, they had pests, or they just didn't do what they were supposed to do. But there's a, another option and for that is anticipating the indoor gardening season. So there really is an opportunity to go and look at gardening into the future. What we're gonna focus on tonight is what plants from your gardens are candidates to move indoors so they can be enjoyed next summer. So I'm not talking about just plants that we're bringing indoors, but what are those things that, plants that really could survive over the winter in one form or another so that you could use them next spring. We're gonna talk about how to prepare the plants for the move, and we're gonna talk about some of the conditions in your home that will allow those plants to thrive. First thing I wanna talk about is the fact that there is no such thing as an indoor plant. Um, when we think about plants in, our, in the garden, we think about plants that will survive in sun versus shade or in a clay soil versus sandy soil. The same holds true for plants that we're bringing into our house. So indoor plants are those plants that can survive in the indoor environment that we have. Um, when we're looking at various plants that we might want to consider that we could bring into the house in one form or another, there are four main categories. The first one is non-hardy plants that have bulbs, tubers, or corms. What do we mean by bulbs, tubers, and corms? Uh, non-hardy. Non-hardy is plants that can't survive in the Minnesota winter. They might be able to survive if we were in a southern environment, but definitely can't now. So we're not talking about bulbs like tulip bulbs or crocus bulbs. 
that do need the coldness of our winter to produce the wonderful flowers in the spring. We're also gonna talk about tropical plants. And when I think about the tropics, I always think of this really hot, sunny um, environment. But in fact, tropical plants are growing on the ground under a canopy of trees, so they aren't getting a lot of sun. They're getting filtered sun. So they are a plant that potentially could survive in our indoor environment. We're also talking about annuals and tender perennials. Um, tender perennials are perennials that would not survive outside in Minnesota, but might survive in a warmer plant, planet, a planet, a warmer climate, um, such as in the southern part of our country. So those also are ones that could make the move into our homes. And finally, we're going to talk about some plants that go through a significant winter dormancy period, plants that um, aren't going to grow um, during the winter but could survive the root system so that we can use them next summer. In addition to thinking about what plants you want to bring in, you also have a bunch of other things to think about. One is cost. Um, the picture I have there is of a Rex begonia that I bought and put in my pots in front of my house uh, along with the coleus and impatience that I usually use. And I spent a heck of a lot more on that plant than I have on those other plants. And so I wanted to figure out, do I have to throw that out or could I somehow help it to survive so I could use it in the subsequent um, summer? So that was a, a, a plant that really was subject to a possibility of moving indoors. There may be a favorite plant. You got something from some friend or neighbor that you really want to survive. Um, you wanna consider, of course, how much space you have in your house and what that space is like. Do you have a lot of sunny windows? Do you, are you living in a large house or are you living in a small apartment? And then finally, you wanna think about, are, do you really wanna move these plants indoors or would you prefer to just start next summer with new plants? If you're gonna be gone for the winter, are you gonna be able to maintain those plants? So those are all considerations um, that you might wanna make before deciding what plants and how many to bring into your home. So um, thinking about there are three main categories um, uh, that we'll address um, relative to how you deal with the plants as you move them into your house. We're gonna talk about storing bulbs, plants that go through a dormancy and those plants that continue to grow and we might, you might call them display plants and we'll talk about those in the future. First bulbs. Um, when we talk about bulbs, it's really a generic term that I'm using here for three different categories. The picture shows tubers at the top, um, corms in the middle, and bulbs at the bottom. The most common tubers for us are potatoes. And for many of us who've grown tomatoes, potatoes, it's, you're growing them so you want to use them in your kitchen. Um, but you could also think about using those potatoes as seed potatoes for next summer. If you wanna do that, when you're pulling those potatoes out of the garden, you wanna wipe them down, don't wash them. Um, just wipe the soil off of them, put them in a cool, dry area of your home and leave them there till about three weeks before next summer when you're planning on planting them. Then they should be ready for you to cut up and put into your garden and hopefully get a whole new crop of, of potatoes next summer. Um, bulbs and corms are a different animal. All three of these are plant pieces, uh, parts of the plant that provide nutrients to the plant itself. Um, I personally haven't done a lot with storage of plants, of bulbs, but I've been fortunate to get some bulbs from Janice Gessner, who successfully overwinters a number of her plants. So I thought it would be more helpful to hear from someone who has experience. So I'm going to ask Janice to unmute and to talk about how she's done things like her calla lilies so that you were able to provide us with those wonderful bulbs. Oh, can you unmute? Robert, can you unmute her? Hmm. Let's see. Is that okay? You can't hear me? There she yes, is. we can hear you now. Okay. All right. Here I go. 
Okay, so uh, I have calla lilies actually that I received from my mother who died in, in 1997. And year after year, I have saved them. Um, and the way I do is just, I actually have started digging now. You, you could wait till it's a little more frosty, but I start now because I have so many. And I cut off just the, right above uh, the, uh, it's called rhizome, you know, so there's a little bit of the stock and I just lay them out in uh, old wash baskets and, and one layer. And they've been sitting in front of my garage and just drying out for three, four days, maybe longer. You know, you want to make sure the, and I, I turn them around uh, so they're totally dry before, you know, just a second, I'm going to turn this off. Hmm. Oh, dear. Okay. So anyway, I want them totally dry and then I pack them in newspaper. Now you can do, I see on your thing you have, pack them in peat moss or uh, other things, but I just pack, I put down a layer of newspaper and then a layer of my bulbs and then another layer of newspaper and I keep them in the um, um, basement or in my garage until December, then into the basement, but some places cool and dark and no sunlight until the next spring when I need them. So. Thank you. And they are, I, I, ha I can vouch for the fact that they come out and they produce wonderful flowers the following yeah. year. Yeah, as year after year and they uh, multiply each year too, <laughs> so. Well. I know someone has offered me some dahlia bulbs, so I'm, I'm looking forward to trying that and having those available for me for next summer. So um, now moving on to pl actual plants themselves, um, we're going to talk about, as I mentioned, tropical plants, annuals, and tender perennials. And there are two options. You can bring full plants into the house, but you can also bring on just cuttings of the, those plants. Um, so, but before you move plants in, you want to prepare those plants for the move. You want to make sure that we bring the indoor, the plants indoors before the nighttime temperatures go down below 45 degrees. Now we've had, we had 45 degree temperatures a week ago here in the Twin Cities, but that was kind of an episodic thing. What we're talking about here is the sole progression of temperatures down, and we want to make sure that you're getting at the plants before they get into the frost season. And just be aware, I, I was surprised to find that on average, we have a frost by, January, by September 27th in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. So it's not too far into the future that we might be looking at colder plants. So the fact that Janice mentioned that she has started to move those bulbs indoors makes a lot of sense. Yeah. When you're moving plants indoors, the other thing you want to do is expose the plants gradually to reduced lighting. So if you have plants in pots, you're going to start to move them into shade. If you're taking plants out of your garden, you're going to want to pot them outside and again move them into a shady area. You're going to want to inspect to make sure that you're bringing healthy plants into the house into your home. Make sure that you're not taking ones that are have a disease so that you're fighting that disease all summer, winter, or you're um, working to make sure that that dis disease doesn't affect other plants in your home. You're going to want to make sure that we're going to inspect for insects and not bring those pests. We just want to bring the plants and not those pests into our home. Um, and finally, it's a chance to look at what the size of the pot you have plants in and make sure that that pot is adequate so that you can do your repotting outside instead of bringing it in and bringing all the dirt and all that stuff into your home. So let's look at the three broad areas of pests. There are really three categories of pests that we're going to look at. The first group are those that are leaf dwelling pests. Um, those include aphids and spider mites, scales and mealybugs. Those plant um, bugs like to live on the plant, on the uh, leaf and on the stems. Generally, you have to make sure you look under the leaves of those plants to make sure that they're not there. That's where they, many of them will reside. To get rid of them, take your hose, wash, wash them down. Make sure that you're not, uh, the hose, um, spray is not harming the uh, leaf, but is strong enough to just push those pests off of your plant. Um, you can also, if you have the plant in a pot, you can dunk that plant into a uh, 
uh, water, put it in the water for 10 to 15 minutes and, and those little guys should float to the top and go away from your plant. If none of those works, you can result to an insecticide, but always encourage that that's kind of the last resort if you can't use water or other natural methods to get rid of them. The next group of bugs are those that reside in your soil. Um, there are th bugs like slugs and soy bugs, earwigs, fungus gnats, and ants. And they would reside generally on the soil around the plant. If you're looking at your plant, you want to make sure you get rid of any um, leaves or dead flowers that are on the soil so that you can look for any of the dead of the bugs. Um, if the plant is in a pot, you might want to remove and look at the soil all around the plant outside of the pot. If you're looking, if you're actually bringing plants in from the, your garden, this is a wonderful opportunity to just take the soil off, wash down the plant, make sure that you have just a plant without the garden soil. Because when you bring the plants indoors, you're going to, going to want to put them in um, potting soil anyway. Gardening soil is much too heavy for plants that are coming into the house. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, again, if none of these work, you can resort to an insecticide. Um, you can also um, add, if you're putting them, soaking them in water like you are here, you can add a little bit of dish soap or hand soap to the water as another deterrent to those bugs. Finally, you're looking at the, if you have plants in pots, you're going to want to make sure that you're not bringing spiders or their eggs into the house that appear on the bottom of the pot. So just scrubbing down those pots to make sure that they aren't coming in is the only thing you have to do for those. So now that hopefully we've gotten rid of all the pests and you're just moving your plants in, we're going to look at what to do as you <coughs> look at um, bringing those plants indoors. The first group are those that go through a, a significant dormancy period. Just like um, a lot of animals, there are a number of plants that do go to sleep for the winter. These include lantanas, fuchsias, and hibiscus. Um, I've read and some people talk about geraniums going through a dormancy period. Um, so I, I, some people, I believe, will treat geraniums this way and others will um, try to help them survive as a display plant that we'll talk about after this um, slide. If you're talking about these plants, you're going to, in late summer, like now, gradually decrease the water and fertilizer because you're now trying to encourage them to go to rest, not to grow. So you want to <coughs> stop fertilizing them, have less water, and bring them in before the first frost. So we're, we're coming to a time when these plants should be moved indoors. You're gonna place them in a dark location, um, a cool location, just like Janice talked about with the bulbs, because again, we're now letting these plants rest for the winter. We're not encouraging growth. What we're gonna be trying to do in this location is to keep the roots um, from drying out. You don't want them to dry out but you want to encourage, don't want to encourage growth. So just keeping them lightly moist during the winter. Hopefully then in the next spring that you'll be able to retrieve those plants and grow them next season. The next group of plants are those that um, will have slow growth. They still have a some, well, somewhat of a dormancy period, um, but that dormancy period just means that they're growing slower. Uh, they don't need the amount of energy that, that they did during the summer. Um, this group, it does include geraniums and hibiscus, succulents. When you look at these, these are the plants you wanna make sure you're bringing healthy plants into the house. You wanna dig out and pot in a medium sized pot that so the plant won't be root bound. As I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you're planting in potting soil. Garden soil is just not going to allow the soil and the water to drain adequately in the house. And you want to make sure you're placing in these plants in a bright, cool spot. 
Um, if you're seeing new shoots coming out, you're not, again, don't want to encourage growth during this period. So you're going to pinch those back so that the energy of the plant can be maintained in the root system and in the mother plant itself. Water the plant when it's dry. And if you, this, the last statement I have here about preventing succulents from getting leg, leggy really applies to all plants. You want to make sure that they're in a sunny, cool location and getting watered adequately so they don't become leggy during the winter season. For many of us, um, you don't have enough room or don't want to bring the whole plant in the house. Um, it so it, one option is to look at getting cuttings of the plants that you have outdoors. Um, if you, this is again the prime time to be cutting those because you want to make sure that you're cutting um, the, the plant and getting a piece that is um, coming off of the healthy plant that is still vibrant. You're going to cut them, you're going to put them in either water or a rooting solution until they develop an adequate um, root system and then planting them in a potting soil. Make sure you're <clears throat> choosing tender young shoots, not ones that are rough and woody, and those will have the best chance for survival during the winter. Um, <clears throat> now that you've moved your plants indoors, you have to make sure that the environment is adequate for those plants to survive and thrive while they're in your, com in your home. I, I've listed five kind of broad areas of concerns that you might want to consider. One is the type and size of pot that you have. The second is the humidity. What's the humidity like in your home? Um, water is essential, of course, and light, what adequate lighting and what kind of nutrients does a plant need when they're working, when they are in the home? So pots. If you're putting a plant in a too large pot, the soil couldn't excuse me, dries slowly, and it makes your plant more susceptible to root rot. So you wanna make sure that the pot's not too big, but if it's too small, it, the, pot, the plant can become root bound. So looking at your plant, making sure that it fits the pot is really important. It's also important to think about what type of pot you're gonna be putting your plant in. Um, I, the most common pots are plastic or terracotta or clay. Plastic pots are wonderful because they're lightweight, they're often cheaper, they'll hold water in more um, significantly, so you have to be careful because you don't want the plants to get too much water. Um, terracotta and clay pots, since they're porous, will draw water out, so you have to water much more frequently. Um, <clears throat> so they actually are a great uh, option for plants like succulents that, that you don't want to have significantly wet. Whatever the type of plant um, pot you've chose, you really should pay, make sure that it has drainage holes so that you don't have water that's collecting inside the soil and potentially rotting the um, roots of the plants that you have in those pots. Um, <clears throat> you want to repot if you're bringing in plants that have been outside and have grown significantly and are root bound, you want to make sure that you're bringing them into a pot that's the right size. I think a lot of us think, okay, I'm moving it in. I want to move it into a big pot so I don't have to do this more frequently. But that's not good for the plant either. If you're moving the plant into a larger pot, make sure that it's no more than two inches wider or two inches deeper than the pot that your plant is in at the current time. Light. <clears throat> Adequate lighting is really essential, even though these plants are not growing as vibrantly as they were outside. A southern facing uh, window is, receives the most light, but it's interesting to note that in December, even if you have it in a southern facing uh, window, that window is, the sun is get, it has, <clears throat> excuse me, one third the amount of energy that it does during June. So those plants still are not gonna be getting as much sun as they would if you had them outside in the summertime. 
And if you think about that, then think about how the limited amount of energy that plants are getting if they're in the east, a north, or a west window. And that at the bottom, I have examples of what, what the differences are in those various windows. If you want to look at um, additional light, you can consider using supplemental lighting. Um, all the nurseries have wonderful options for you. Um, and you wanna make sure that it's appropriate for the type of plant you have. But one caveat is to make sure that you have supplemental light that's gonna be turned off at, um, each day. Plants just like us people need to go to sleep at night and so they need a period of time when there is no light. So either putting them on a timer or making sure that you turn that supplemental light off each day is very important. Water. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that people make with their indoor plants is overwatering. You want to make sure that you're watering your plants on their schedule, not yours. You know, for most of us, it's easier to say, okay, I plant, water my plants on Monday, and then next Thursday, I'll water them again. But um, watching your plants is really important. Look at the plants for signs of problems for overwatering or underwatering. If you're seeing plants that are slower growing than you think they should be, if their leaves are kind of dry and brittle and the leaves start to, they start to drop their leaves, um, if you're seeing that the stems are somewhat brittle, that may be a si signs that you are underwatering the plant. Overwatering the plant, you'll see some, you might start to smell the mo um, mildew or mold and the roots will start to rot. It, you also might feel the stem at the bottom of the plant getting a little mushy. So that's telling you that you're giving the plant way too much water. Um, what you're going to want to do is stick your finger in about an inch, feel to make sure that, that, that the soil is moist down to that inch level. And if not, if it is, then don't water the plant. Make sure when you're watering the plant that you have water that's draining through the hole and then remove the water that's in the pot so that, again, the plant is not, doesn't have its roots sitting in water during that period of time. Humidity is totally different. We all know what it feels like in the winter on our skin that gets dried out. Well, plants have the same need for humidity and there are a bunch of ways that you can assure that they have the adequate humidity. First of all, you could group plants. Um, plants let off water through their um, leaves. So if you group them, they create an environment that will support all the plants. You can also mist the plants, but a lot of people discourage that as an option because it's a very short term option. And if you have plants like African violets or other plants that have hairy leaves, you can create um, diseases in those plants by having the moisture being held on by, the, by those hairs on the leaves. A pebble tray is a wonderful way to add humidity. Putting a tray with pebbles and water in it um, under the tree, the, under the plant as is shown in the upper um, picture or just even beside the plant is a wonderful way to add humidity. Terrariums is another option. Of course, you can always add your own humidifier and you can bring your plants. If you have a bathroom or a kitchen that has... has Uh-oh, Robert. Um, I also, I, I, I know a number of people who actually um, will put it will give their plants a little shower they'll just they have them in their living room but they bring them into the bathroom when they're taking showers just to let the humidity from the bathroom help that plant finally if you have an older home that has a wood stove or radiators just putting a pot of water that you allow to evaporate can add humidity to those plants nutrients we all think about fertilizer and feel like we need to give our plants fertilizer, but you have to remember that as we were talking about plants don't grow as rigorously during the winter. 
so they don't require as much fertilizer. And in fact, I mean, we would discourage you from giving any fertilizer to plants that are under natural light between December and February. So not until you're about ready to go outside would you start to refertilize your plants. This is a list of some plants that would that you might want to consider indoors. It certainly isn't an exhaustive list, and I bet all any of you could give me a names of other plants that you've successfully overwintered. Um, included here are flowers, but also um, I haven't talked specifically about, but you certainly could think about herbs and vegetables. And especially now when you can find varieties of carrots that are dwarf carrots that grow well inside, or tomatoes, little cherry tomatoes can do very well inside. So don't, don't hesitate to think about bringing these in. I've had wonderful success with a lot of herbs. I've had more problem with parsley, and I think that um, it's because of the moisture, the humidity in my home that it just, they haven't worked as well. So other uh, herbs have been wonderful and the parsley for some reason just didn't survive as well. I have a list of um, references. Um, I ref um, some of them refer to specific like geraniums and fuchsia. Someone I think at the beginning of the um, talk asked about fuchsias. Um, there is a, this, this is a reference to an article on overwintering fuchsias. Um, it also talks about things like insecticide soaps that I haven't used, but is an effective way to treat plants and gives you other information if you need on, on some of the topics that I covered. I've talked real quickly. How, do we have any questions or comments, Robert, that we should be addressing? Um, I don't have any at the moment, but maybe some of the participants would like to ask something. You have everybody muted at this point. I actually um, have one quick question, or not, maybe not a question, but a comment. You talked about doing um, herbs and stuff and whatnot in the house. I yep. don't know if you are ever interested in hydroponics, but that's what I've gotten into in the winter because I just love growing my own stuff. So um, I put my herbs and um, lettuce, spinach, and kale in hydroponics. And I just do the crack key, so I don't have to all that. I have all the pumps and everything. Just something Wonderful. you guys might be interested in. That works excellent. You don't have to monitor it too much. It's just easy. What type of setup do you have? I actually use the Rubbermaid totes, and I cut holes in the top lid, and uh -huh. I put pots in with um, peat, peat and nut pots, and then I just fill it with nutrients. Um, as you don't even really have to mess with the nutrients because as the nutrient level goes down, the roots go down, so they stay in they stay in the nutrient solution, and you really don't have to mess with them. By the time you have to add or change the water, your plant is pretty much done anyway, and you got to start over. So, yeah, it's been a really good way to keep healthy food in the house for the winter, <laughs> and it, it keeps you from getting depressed. I have winter depression, so all the indoor gardening is just there's just something to that that just keeps my mood up. I agree. I I'd actually tried some hydroponics last winter, um, but it was a kit that I got, and I don't think you need to. That's why I was really interested in hearing what you were using. It was yeah, wonderful. It was, it was cheap. Very I just cool. buy the three-part nutrient system and the shoe boxes and net pots, and that's all I use. That's great. Thank you. That That's wonderful. That I'm going to have to try some more. I was worried about having the adequate sun or light for it. You, you use heard. supplemental light? I have them under T8 fluorescent lights, just really simple T8s. And then you have to put the plants really close to the lights, but I have them on chains and I just keep hooking them higher and higher as the plants grow. So it just works really well. It's really slick. Can I Thank just you. comment for a moment? Um, um, some people have been asking, um, is it too early to bring them in? And maybe they missed out in the first part of the question. So you can end. Um, talk about that again, um, Linda, but also they want to know if this um, um, whole slideshow can be sent to them. And I'd like to tell everyone, if you want it sent to you, um, in the chat box, please put your email address. No, no, Robert. No, no, sorry. No, I sent, I put my email there. They need to email me directly for it. Okay. I just can't write them down fast enough. Yeah. <laughs> There's over so, 100. 
What was your okay, email? Okay, so put your email address in the chat box. No, Janice oh. has your Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Janice will. I, I look at Janice's email. Yeah, I, and just send it to me because I, I can't write fast enough to, to get all hundred. <laughs> what was your email address? It's, it's in the chat box, janicemgg at comcast.net. It's in the chat box. Do you see that, the box? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so again, Janice, J-A-N-I-C-E-M-G-G -G at gmail.com. No, no, Comcast. <laughs> Comcast.net, okay. okay. Somebody's <laughs> trying to plant uh, tulips um, for indoors. Maybe you can respond to that. Ooh. Oh, no, we've always said... <clears throat> well, we have we have had different um, tulips and spring bulbs in this and forced them for winter, and we have a lot of fun with that. But my question really is dealing with um, rosemary and some of those herbs. tougher tougher herbs. You know what I mean. Yeah. And also, uh, is is there somebody here that does? work with orchids. My husband gave me a beautiful one for my birthday and I want to keep it. I've got three of them. <laughs> oh, I'd love to pre give the presentation that we heard in our Master Garden program on orchids. Oh. I, I have not had as much success. Is there someone here who's successfully overwintered orchids? Didn't Jetsy say she did? Hi, Jody. Yeah. Uh, I'm not actually Jesse. I'm Susan. That's my son's name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he set up this whole Zoom thing and I don't know how to change the name on it. Okay. I have three orchids and um, I I have them in Lekka or the clay pellets. Okay. And I just... Are you I listening? Pretty, I just kind of ignore them. I put them outside on my deck in the shade. In the summer, it's on the north side of my house, so it's shady. And then I bring them in the house and I just um, hang them like off to the side of the, let's see, the west window. They're off to the side of it, so they're not getting direct sunlight. And then once a week, I take them off the wall, and I set them in a bowl of, um, usually I melt snow water, and I set them in that for like, I don't know, 20 minutes, and then I let them drain, and I hang them back up, and they do really well. Oh, well, thank you. I will have to, we, I've got one that we have been successful in getting it to rebloom, and then he got me this one this year, so... In I hope opinion, I can keep them going. In my opinion, stay away from the bark. Because the bark stays too wet and you get a lot of rot and then your plant's not going to bloom and what and grow new leaves and it's just not going to thrive. I really? Think How come everybody says use bark then? I think they're crazy. I used to tell it's my, I had mine in bark to start with and they were dying. And I switched them over to clay pellets and they've been fabulous ever since. Thank you. The bark is what you get when you buy orchid soil. Yeah. yeah. Wash, get them out of that bark, wash all the bark off underneath warm water, and then just put them in the pellets. Or actually, like, most most of the orchids don't even need. You could mount them on a chunk of wood. Yeah. On the wall. You can just leave the, the roots hang. You can hang them on the wall that way. They don't even need dirt or soil or bark or anything, honestly. I've heard that. It's a matter of putting them in a pot and making them look nice. Yeah. I want to get back to the question someone was asking the, about when to bring plants in. Um, I just reinforce, as Janice talked about with her bulbs, generally um, she has already started to take those in to let them dry out and get ready for their summer, their winter in the house. Um, other plants, you do want to make sure that they, you bring them in before the temperatures are steadily at 45 degrees or lower in temperature. So now is a good time. Um, if you're trying to get um, cuttings of plants, you want to do that definitely now while the, you still have healthy plants outside and you can get cuttings that are healthy and can be re-rooted in your house. Um, Linda, they also want to know about what kind of temperature for the bulbs, how cold, um, the temperature Generally, they be. talk about 40 to 50 degrees. What do you, do you know what the temperature in your house is, Janice? Oh, 50 to, for uh, my, my bulbs, it's 50 to 70 is what they recommend. Okay. 
so it isn't quite as cold. So, because I've always been worried about that, that I, you know, you're trying to find a place in your house that's cold enough yeah. to allow them to relax. So if you're able to do it in the, in the basement with um, temperatures at that level. Um, Jesse's mom, can you tell us where to get clay pellets? Jesse's mom. <laughs> <laughs> I just ordered them off Amazon. Okay. Did you hear that? Okay. <laughs> I have my husband over here and I have to make sure he's an agronomist. I have to make sure he gets all this. <laughs> <laughs> what a team. Pardon? What a team you have. Yeah, we work. He's a, he's a forensic agronomist and I'm a sociologist. So we work together pretty good. All right. Hi. <laughs> Other questions or comments? You had a question from Susan about what about a bougainvillea via cuttings or prune back the plant? I think you can do either, depending on what size plant and, and how healthy the plant is. Yeah. Um, if you're cutting it back, make sure that you're cutting back and you're cutting the root system, you're pruning the root system and the plant itself. And, and Kelly asked, should I let the cannas freeze back before I bring those in those big bulbs? Say again, I, I missed that, Janice. She what do you said, have? should I let the cannas freeze back before yes. I bring in those big bulbs? You know, that would be similar to what you're doing with the calla lily. Yeah, I, I'd bring them in before freezing, yeah. Yeah. What about and it seems or? like you can get um, these pellets at Ikea and Eco Gardens in St. Paul. So there seems to be a lot of different places you can get these clay pellets. Well, I live in the teeny tiny town of Albany, so we don't have nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> Anything else? What about elephant deer? I've done that for the first time this year and I really don't know what to do with them. Is that just like any other bulb? Just dig it up and bring it in? I've seen people yeah. keep it alive over the winter and not let it rest at all. Do you know anything about that? Has anybody dealt with elephant ears? Um, when I was preparing this, there was a discussion about elephant ears as just um, dealing with them the same as you would with, again, other bulbs. Yeah, somebody, somebody told me that they've had really good success they they cut off the the leaves the vegetation and they dry the bulb and they do the same thing that janice recommended by putting it in newspaper um because it the plant's just too big to bring in <laughs> maybe <Yeah. laughs> um somebody was asking about spearmint and peppermint um well my spearmint will grow outside um, it overwinters fine. Yeah. You can't kill it. So that's right. I don't think you need to bring it in. No, I well, agree. It's so good to make yeah. tea and stuff all winter. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, if you want it inside in the winter, it certainly can survive. But but you don't have to worry about it dying down in the winter. You're going to have spearmint or peppermint next spring if you have it in your garden now. I've got spearmint and chocolate mint, and it's insane. Yeah, my grandson planted it. He's so excited about his chocolate mint in his garden. Mm. Chocolate mint this year. My son bought it for me for Mother's Day. <laughs> um, can someone talk about um, gladiolas? Again, the bulbs. I'm dealing with them in the same way that we talked about. I'm taking them out, drying them, and storing them in a cool, dry spot for the winter. Somebody is asking about potted strawberries and lavender. Um, I don't know why you couldn't bring those in. Does any, has anyone had experience with? Lavender would be like any other herb that you could bring in yeah. and, and grow successfully. It's a mint. Yeah. I've got to bring lavender and rosemary in every winter and it dies, so I can't tell you anything. Yeah, though. rosemary does, yes. I can't keep it going. Isn't that funny? And it's my parsley that doesn't like to grow. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Anything else? 
I have a question about um, herbs that are planted in the ground. They're not in pots. Can you just pot those up and bring them inside? Yeah, again, I, I really encourage you, if you're taking plants out of the garden, take, take the plants, wash the soil off of them. Off of them, okay. And then pot them in potting soil. You're going to get rid of the pests. You're going to put them in plant and soil that will encourage. Maybe that's what we need to do with grow. those plants in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have spoke. Um, I have a question so about minutes. potting soil. Um, does anybody make homemade potting soil, and what do they do? Oh, there is a recipe. I haven't done that. Is there anyone on this call that has? created their own potting soil? It certainly is doable. I mean, there, there are um, recipes yeah. for how you include, you know, soil and peat moss and other mm -hmm. products to mix to make the uh, an appropriate yeah. uh, medium for growing. I, I would just encourage you to look online. Um, we, as Master Gardeners, encourage you to look at um, sources that are extension services from some of the universities around the country so that you make sure you're really getting accurate information. But I know there are there is information on that on the internet. How do we feel about miracle Grow potting soil? Because I've heard bad things about it. I don't know. Um, I don't personally have any comment. Does, again, mm -hmm. people heard anything that's... No, I don't know. I don't use it, but I'm good about it. You know, the, the only thing I, I, when I look at any of the potting soils, you do want to look at the, the composition, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and, that, and potassium that's in the plants, because having the right potting soil can affect how the plant blossoms, or if you're talking about doing vegetables, having um, appropriate potassium and phosphorus so you get adequate root development is really important. I have a question. Yes. I have four hibiscus that I've had for years and I have one that's bloomed but none of the others ever bloom and I bring them in every winter and they do well and then they go back out and they're they have beautiful green leaves but one of them has bloomed. And I keep saying to my partner, he, we both love them. I'm from Texas, so they did really well in Texas, but here they're not so well, you know, except if you bring them in, but I haven't been able to get them to bloom. So I'm Maybe thinking- Maybe you have to take them to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're homesick. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, th the questions might be related and it could be the, the um, environment or it could be that you, they have to add some nitrogen or some other mm -hmm. compounds to it. Nitrogen promotes blooming okay. fertilizer, so you might want to look at that. So I could overwinter them and then try that in the spring? Is that what you're saying? Are you, yeah. Are, did you, have you changed, do you keep them in the same soil? Have they been in the yep. same soil for the whole time? Yeah. So they may need some new soil or um, amendments to that soil. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. I, um, I hear somebody. I wrote, down, I wrote down for storing bulbs, um, peat moss, bark chips, sawdust, or layering in newspaper. Yes. Um, back in the 80s, I was told to put my dahlia bulbs in vermiculite or perlite. Have we got new information on that? Is that something that's changed over the decades? Janice, what, do you know anything? You know, I, I don't know. Perlite, you know, you have all those little white, um, they might be yeah. kind of messy to, to me. Okay. Yeah. I put mine in perlite one year and they dried up like like yeah. bone dry. It was yeah. really not good. So okay. I'm not, I'm just happy I think perlite will just suck the, mu the moisture right out of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might be a problem. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone. I hope you're getting some information. I hope you have a wonderful, successful winter season. I wish you good luck, and I hope you'll really enjoy our second gardening season here in mm -hmm. Minnesota.
Mm -hmm. um, again, you. if you um, want a copy of the slide presentation, email Janice and she, you should be able to see her email address in the chat room. And if you have any other questions or comments, please share those and we'll try and, um, I, I'll try and get back to you if, and research any questions that we haven't been able to answer today. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy and stay well. <laughs>